So, hello, everybody. Well, be just to remind you, before we start, uh, switch off your phones or uh, put it on silent mode. So um, we're ready to start. A week ago here in this room, we were talking about the situation around Ukraine with the Ukrainian uh, ambassador who was very concerned. Uh, of the, he was talking about concentration of Russian troops near Ukrainian border. Uh, well, a week has passed, uh, nothing much has changed, but uh, the rhetoric of Western countries um, has become more alarming. The, uh, the reports that uh, the United States and the United Kingdom are uh, ready to impose new sanctions against Russian assets and Russian elite. Uh, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson even cancelled his visit to Japan and switched it to Ukraine. So. Um, as for the threat of Russia's in, uh, invasion to Ukraine, well, I, I think that all concerned countries are talking about it, all but one, Russia itself, because it says that it has no plans to attack, although it has uh, its concerns and demands to NATO. To, and so today we have uh, His Excellency Ambassador of Russia to Japan, Mr. Mikhail Galuzin, who will, I hope, share uh, some interesting insights with us, clarify position of Russia towards this issue, and explain to us why Moscow haven't, hasn't uh, conquered Kyiv yet, because <laughs> it seems that a lot of important people outside Ukraine and Russia are getting anxious and, I would say, disappointed. So please, Mr. Ambassador, take a stand before we proceed to questions from the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Sergey. Uh, good morning, dear members of uh, Foreign Correspondents Club Japan. Uh, first of all, I must emphasize uh, that uh, nowadays we witness how people here in Japan and all over the world are furiously fighting COVID-19 uh, disease. Uh, we extend our sincere condolences to those who lost their loved ones, who lost their friends and relatives, and uh, we wish speedy recovery to those who are now suffering with, uh, struggling with this uh, disease. And for everyone who is uh, present here today, I wish, I wish to stay safe and sound, first of all. Uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude uh, to the Foreign Correspondents Club uh, Japan for this valuable opportunity to make a presentation here today. Uh, I'm also uh, very pleased to make this speech on the eve of the Day of uh, Diplomatic Service, uh, which is celebrated in Russia on February 10th to commemorate the day when the ambassadorial board, uh, a prototype of the current foreign minister of Russia, was established. So today, uh, I would like to touch upon a very uh, a critically important and topical issue, uh, situation in the European security. Uh, when we were preparing for today's a meeting for today's news conference, uh, I was uh, told uh, about, I, I was asked to explain our position with regard to what uh, you called uh, a crisis on the border between Russia and Ukraine. But uh, the situation is uh, much more serious and much broader uh, than just uh, a spot on geographic map you mentioned. Uh, that is why I would like to uh, present my view, uh, view of my government, view of my leadership uh, to the situation in the European security in general. Because uh, from our point of view, the situation in the area of uh, security in Europe is in deep and systematic crisis which derives from aggressive policy of the U.S. and its whole, wholeheartedly loyal allies. Their aim is to maintain the dominance and prevailing influence of the West over the world, while completely ignoring the obvious fact that the world has already become multipolar. In fact, we see the persistent intolerance of the United States and its allies 
to, to, towards those who pursue an independent policy. Pakistan protecting national interests in accordance with international law, primarily with the UN Charter. Such independence contradicts a concept of so-called rules-based order, where these so-called rules are invented by the Western countries to protect their own narrow interests with disregard to the discussions in the United Nations. One of the elements of such aggressive policy is the long-term NATO expansion to the east. Now, as you may see, they are already very close to the Russian borders. All this is being done despite repeated verbal promises given by NATO to the Soviet and Russian leadership uh, to not expand NATO to the east. And also, it is being done in violation of the commitments under the Charter for European Security, signed by all NATO members uh, at the highest level within the framework of the OSCE in 1999 in Istanbul. It includes a formula of indivisible security. The formula is pretty simple. First, every country is free to choose or change its security arrangements. Second, no state is to strengthen its security at the expense of the security of other states. In this context, I would like to point out very peculiar understanding of this formula by Western partners. Considering the first part of it as a right uh, of any country to become a NATO member state, they completely ignore the second part of the equation the principle not to undermine the security of others. It is precisely the principle which the Russian side stresses out right now. There is no alternative to equal and indivisible security for everyone in Europe. Uh, there are a row of reasons, plenty of reasons for Russia to feel growing threat to our security. First of all, the U.S. and other NATO members officially declare Russia as an opponent in their strategic documents. Even though there is no grounds for ideological conflict in the modern world, and the USSR and the Warsaw Treaty Organization, countering of which was NATO's raise or debtor, ceased to exist. And it is not only about the wording. It is the Americans who have record rates of military presence outside their national territory. American military officers, advisors, and weapons, including nuclear, are often located thousands of kilometers away from Washington, D.C. According to open-sourced data from the Internet, the United, Na the United States maintains approximately 750 military bases in more than 80 states of the world. The total number of U.S. military servicemen abroad amounts to 175,000, and more than 60,000 of them are deployed in Europe. By the way, about 50,000, as far as I know, are deployed here in Japan, by the way. The U.S. military budget in 2020 stood at $778 billion, which is 12 times more than Russian one only $61 billion. Secondly, the US and NATO have accumulated quite a vast negative, if not to say criminal, track record of unlawful armed aggression, which claimed dozens and hundreds of lives, lives of people in the countries in which they were bringing what NATO cynically calls peace and democracy. The United States, the United States uh, repeatedly used force against other states without UN Security Council consent. As reported by American experts, 84 out of 193 UN member states have ever been subjected to US occupation or aggression to some degree. This list includes former Yugoslavia, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and others. The results of such actions are not only destructive and destabilizing, but also caused the emergence of new threats to the international community, like international terrorism. Specifically, Serbia was split and the whole region Kosovo was taken from it and, in violation of the UN Security Council resolutions, turned into an allegedly independent territorial entity. 
The statehood of Iraq and Libya were destroyed, and the terrible consequences of such actions are very well known. Moreover, we always have to take into account the fact that the US and NATO are not very reliable partners. They are not only very utilitarian, even towards their allies, let alone opponents, ignoring their interests in favor of its own geopolitical ambitions. And the very example of it is the recent scandal about the arms contract when the AUKUS was formed. But also the United States and NATO quite easily abandon and betray their allies and partners. Take Afghanistan as an example. For 20 years, uh, the US and NATO had done nothing but in fact contributing to an unprecedented increase in drug production. As a result, we have a very difficult, dangerous, and unpredictable situation in this country. In other words, for NATO and its members, uh, there is truly nothing sacred, no obligations. It is, it, is better to take an, uh, to, it is better to take a note of this fact, especially for those who nowadays are actively inviting NATO members to the Asia-Pacific region. I presume it is crystal clear now why Russia, and as a matter of fact, any other truly independent and responsible state, does not want to see such a dangerous, irresponsible, and, 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 and adventurous player as NATO at its gates. In reality, NATO is already very close to Russian borders. It is in the immediate vicinity uh, of our territory. Uh, and since 2014, when the US and other Western countries uh, masterminded and supported uh, the unconstitutional coup in Ukraine conducted by extremist and neo-Nazi forces, the alliance was steadily developing ties with Kyiv, aimed it at its eventual membership in NATO. It is because of such geopolitical games that our Ukrainian neighbors have been suffering for almost eight years. Ukrainians are brainwashed to cultivate Russophobic and radical sentiment. They are taught to believe that Ukraine's radiant future depends on whether it seeks EU and NATO membership rather than whether it tries to improve relations with neighbors. And uh, the US and NATO want, uh, all the US and NATO want is to prevent natural brother-like coexistence of our two states and peoples uh, that, would undermine, that would have undermined plans to weaken Russia and create a rim of instability around it. It is clear that Ukraine cannot contribute to NATO security. But uh, Ukraine's accession to NATO will really undermine relations with Russia because it will be a gross violation of the official political commitment made by the top leaders of the US and, their, and other NATO countries. Uh, however, our proposals to the NATO and uh, uh, US regarding legally binding security guarantees are not limited uh, to the Ukrainian problem. I believe uh, that most, most of you have already read our drafts. Uh, uh, they have been made public as we have nothing to hide. Uh, the main purpose of the documents is to de-escalate and stabilize the situation in the Euro-Atlantic. There are three basic core elements there. To put on paper that the United States and its NATO allies, firstly, will uh, not expand uh, the alliance eastward any further. Secondly. Uh, will not deploy strike weapons close to Russian border. And thirdly, the return to the status quo ante of 1997, before several waves of expansion of NATO's infrastructure uh, to the east. Last week, we received the written response from the American side as well as from NATO. Uh, they are being studied thoroughly in Moscow. But the responses didn't address the above-mentioned three fundamental concerns of Russia. Uh, at the same time, the responses offer grounds for serious talks, but only on the matters of secondary importance. 
On January 28th, the uh, Foreign Minister of Russia, Mr. Sergei Lavrov, sent an official request to the colleagues in the NATO and OSCE countries asking them to explain how they intend to honor their obligation not to strengthen uh, their security at the expense of other countries' security. And if they don't inten intend to honor it, we would like uh, them to explain why not. As Mr. Lavrov uh, pointed out, it will be the key factor for determining our future steps on this matter. By the way, the text of the letter is available here in this hall, uh, so please uh, have a look uh, at the text. I hope uh, that my speech today uh, was of help for every one of you, uh, and now you maybe will understand the Russian position <coughs> on that matter deeper and better. I thank you very much for your kind attention, and I'm open for Q&A uh, session. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. <coughs> uh, Ambassador. So before we proceed to questions, I, uh, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Sergei Mingajev. Yes, I am a Russian state uh, television journalist. And actually, this is my first um, role as a moderator, so please. <laughs> Give me some slack if something goes not <laughs> as you uh, used to. So please, uh, let's proceed to the questions. Who, who is going to be the first? Uh, well, uh, talking about uh, the escalation mm -hmm. of um, uh, the Russian-Ukrainian border, if we imagine the situation uh, that, um, for instance, the Ukrainian army starts a massive offensive attack on the whole front using those lethal weapons that um, it's receiving from Western countries in huge amounts. What will be the response of Russia? What will be the, how? Because um, no doubt any attempt to help forces in Donbass or uh, by uh, supplying them with weapons or um, uh, with direct military support would be condemned by uh, Western governments and uh, it would be a pretext for a further um, Russian isolation and imposing sanctions. So does Russia has, have um, any contingency plan in case of this development? What will be the response of Russia if there is, gonna, uh, if there is a new spark of uh, war in Donbass? Well, uh, first of all, I, I, I would like to uh, stress what Minister Lavrov uh, recently said, uh, maybe responding to, the, to a similar question, uh, that he said that uh, if it depends on us, there will be no war, first of all. Then, uh, frankly, uh, Sergei, in diplomacy, we uh, do not uh, operate such terms as what if. Uh, we face the reality. And uh, the uh, reality is that uh, we, first of all, uh, are focusing on diplomatic and political instruments to uh, settle the issues of European security, including uh, the situation uh, regarding uh, to the Western attempts to involve uh, Ukraine uh, in uh, NATO. So uh, that is why uh, uh, we that is why we proposed, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, we proposed two documents: one for the United States and one for the NATO member states on uh, mutual security guarantees uh, to settle the issue. And uh, the three pillars of this uh, initiative I have just mentioned. Uh, we uh, expect serious consideration and serious and responsible response uh, from the NATO member states uh, to this uh, our initiative. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, we are uh, very much uh, committed 
to our fundamental principled position, which we uh, have already uh, announced, declared for many times, uh, that as far as uh, internal domestic civil conflict in Ukraine, in the eastern part of Ukraine is concerned, uh, there is no alternative to the solution uh, to the settlement of this conflict uh, than uh, Minsk agreements, uh, which should be, first of all, uh, which should be uh, obeyed uh, by the Ukrainian government, by the Kiev regime, who uh, in fact rejects to follow, uh, to, to implement uh, the Minsk agreements, uh, to implement its obligations in accordance to Minsk agreements. Uh, and, and first of all, to uh, start uh, direct uh, talks, direct dialogue uh, with uh, the particular uh, uh, particular districts uh, of Donetsk and Lugansk uh, regions of uh, Lugansk uh, regions. Uh, we also uh, uh, emphasize uh, the very dangerous and irresponsible uh, policy of the US and NATO, who are pumping uh, Kyiv regime with uh, the weapons the weapons uh, which Kyiv regime uses against uh, its own people in the eastern part of Ukraine, uh, thus escalating uh, the conflict, escalating tensions instead of uh, decreasing it. Uh, so, uh, and when I cited my minister's words uh, that uh, as far as it is, uh, uh, if it depends on, on, on Russia, there will be no war. I would like also to cite my minister uh, saying that uh, it, uh, that every, uh, uh, the situation is that everything uh, does not depend depends, does not depend only on us, because uh, uh, on the uh, let's say Ukrainian side of the border uh, there are so-called national battal battalions who are. Uh, in fact, not under control of the Kiev government. And uh, we cannot uh, predict, cannot anticipate what kind of provocations may be uh, committed uh, by these battalions uh, and other irresponsible elements, elements uh, on, the Ukrainian, on the Ukrainian side. Thank you. So, uh, do we have any, anybody who wants to ask questions? From the floor, yes, please. Hello, Masada. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tatsuya Sato from Japanese newspaper Asa Shimbu. Uh, my question question is uh, impact to Japan. Uh, there is a possibility of the uh, economic economical sanction to uh, your country from uh, the West. So, uh, what would be the, uh, your country's response uh, against Japan if Japan joins to the such kind of economic sanction? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much for your question. Well, first of all, uh, <laughs> you are quite right saying uh, that uh, the West is uh, threatening uh, us uh, by uh, a possibility of what they call sanctions. Uh, this uh, behavior of the West uh, confirms once again that the US and NATO have completely forgotten what diplomacy is. Uh, they are uh, urging us to, as they say, come back to diplomacy. But at the same time, uh, they do not uh, exercise diplomacy by themselves. They just put their demands. And if their counterpart says that uh, it has its own position, its own view on the issue, they just uh, starting, I mean, the US and NATO, just starting to uh, threaten, uh, to intimidate 
by a possibility of strength of sanctions, which is not diplomacy, uh, which is violence, uh, which is a violation of uh, the fundamental principles of diplomacy, of the fundamental principles of uh, dealing with the uh, international uh, issues. Uh, well, uh, our uh, our uh, my leadership, my uh, president, my minister of foreign affairs, uh, have already made it clear uh, of uh, uh, about how our response could be. Uh, I would like to cite my minister again that uh, when he said recently that uh, if uh, there are sanctions of such kind as personal sanctions towards the Russian leadership or uh, if there are sanctions cutting off Russia from the uh, mechanisms of financial activity, in the world, uh, this will be equal to cutting off relations. This would be equal to severing relations. Uh, you mentioned about Japan. Yes, I heard uh, and, wrote, uh, and uh, read uh, the statements uh, from the Japanese government saying that uh, there might be what they call strong actions Tsuyo uh, Ikodo, against Russia uh, in case uh, there is a Russian, uh, uh, alleged Russian incursion uh, into Ukraine. About the possibility of Russian incursion into Ukraine, I have just answered that there is no war uh, from Russian side. Uh, so uh, as far as these strong actions remarks are concerned, uh, well, uh, I think that they contradict the spirit of uh, good neighborly Russian-Japanese relations. Uh, they uh, contradict to the agreements between our leaders uh, to uh, develop all-round uh, relations uh, between uh, Russia uh, and uh, Japan, uh, and uh, uh, that is why I think that uh, th these uh, remarks about so-called strong actions against Russia are counterproductive. They uh, do not contribute to the creation of a uh, good atmosphere, positive atmosphere, uh, <laughs> in uh, dialogue uh, between uh, Russia and uh, Japan. Uh, and I would like to recommend sincerely to our Japanese colleagues to read again and to, 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 to deeply study uh, our uh, proposals, our initiatives uh, with regard to European security that we have uh, presented to the U.S. and uh, NATO. Thank you. And to this question, we also have um, no questions from our online participants. Mm -hmm. How Japan's position on the Ukraine now, if it's, uh, it's the question from Eric Johnson, the Japan Times. Uh, how uh, Japan's position on Ukraine now affect its relationship with Russia and with further negotiations of the northern territories? Well, just, just to continue. The question of you mean the question code. is how the how uh, uh, how it uh, affects the no, position of Japan? Today's position of Japan on Ukraine affects uh, its relationship with Russia and mm -hmm. uh, with further negotiations mm -hmm. over the northern territories. That's mm -hmm. how this question is put. Well, first of all, it is about if it is about uh, the position of uh, Japan, it is for a Japan diplomat uh, to to answer. Uh, for, Japan, for a Japan diplomat to comment. It's one point. Second point is uh, we have never conducted any dialogue with Japan on the issue uh, the Japan Times correspondent mentioned, uh, namely uh, about what he, call, he or she calls northern, the Northern Territories. 
uh, we have always been conducting uh, the uh, dialogue with Japan on a peace treaty issue. And uh, most recently, we uh, uh, have been conducting uh, the uh, dialogue uh, on the peace treaty issue in accordance with uh, Singapore agreement between our leaders, which uh, stipulates uh, that we will uh, speed up uh, our dialogue on the basis of the Soviet-Japanese joint declaration of 1956. And this declaration clearly uh, envisages that first uh, the peace treaty should be concluded. And then uh, the other issues uh, might be uh, discussed. This peace treaty should not be a document that is usually signed the next morning after uh, the ceasefire during the war. Uh, the ceasefire took place back in uh, September uh, 1945, and since that our relations have, been, have developed greatly in a very positive way, though their potential is, is not utilized fully to the benefit of uh, the two countries and uh, the two, uh, the two uh, peoples. And we consider this future Russian-Japanese treaty as a broader document than just a peace treaty, document uh, which uh, uh, will be about peace, friendship, good neighborhood, partnership, so uh, uh, there should be a comprehensive documents uh, showing uh, bright uh, and positive prospects of uh, the mutually beneficial Russian-Japanese cooperation in trade, economic, uh, and technological area uh, uh, in uh, the area of building up security measures uh, and in the area of joint efforts uh, to solve topical international issues in such areas as inter-regional inter exchange, cultural, educational, sport exchange, etc. Uh, by the way, uh, last week in Sapporo, I attended the opening ceremony of the uh, year of inter-regional inter and uh, sister city exchange between uh, Russia and Japan. It was a very, very positive, very, very uh, uh, bright uh, ceremony which uh, demonstrated once again how rich is the uh, potential of uh, the Russian-Japanese uh, relations of the Russian-Japanese exchange. So, uh, I, I just, uh, returning to the point of the question uh, from the Japan Times, uh, I would like to uh, emphasize uh, that uh, we uh, consider uh, the, the, the statements uh, that we heard from the Japanese government about so-called strong actions against uh, Russia uh, as counterproductive for the uh, atmosphere of Russian-Japanese dialogue, of uh, Russian-Japanese uh, relations, and uh, as ambassador here in Japan, uh, as, as ambassador of Russia to Japan, uh, I just uh, would like to express my sincere hope uh, that uh, uh, the, 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 the responsible attitude, the responsible approach towards uh, the future of the Russian-Japanese relations will prevail, finally prevail in Tokyo. Thank you. So, next question, please. Yes, please. Hello, welcome uh, back at the Foreign Correspondent Club, Ambassador. My name is Pio D'Emilia from uh, Italian Sky TG24 TV. As European, of course, I should ask you questions on Ukrainian, but as a Japanese resident, I think for the time being, I'll stick to the Japanese side um, since this uh, issue came up. Um, well, first of all, I'm one of the survivors here that attended the, the historical meeting between Gorbachev mm -hmm. and Kaifu many years ago. Mm -hmm. It was 1989, probably. Uh, 
And I remember the long uh, extended talks that went up every morning. Um, according with what I just heard from you, it seems that it's very clear that Russia will not settle for a separate solution of the so-called Northern Territory issues unless uh, the whole peace treaty uh, will be signed. Um, so can you please confirm to us that there is no such an issue from the Russian side of Northern Territories, but there is a still the issue of the peace treaty with Japan? Mm -hmm. This is a clear statement that I would like to have from you. Mm -hmm. And secondly, since it seems that uh, situation of the pandemic has a little bit improving internationally. Mm. Do you foresee after the next uh, days a visit of uh, Putin to China, the chance of uh, having, uh, you know, Prime Minister of England, uh, uh, Johnson has said that would probably come to Japan. Do you, are you preparing, are you uh, envisaging a visit of Putin in Japan to start again in person negotiation on the peace treaty. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Pia. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, the Soviet-Japanese uh, summit uh, with the participation of uh, Mr. Mikhail Gorbachev and Mr. Tosiki Kaifu, who unfortunately recently passed away and I uh, avail myself, myself of this opportunity to express my deepest condolences to his family. Uh, it took place uh, in April 1991, not in uh, 80, uh, 89. Well, no, it's just just for uh, for your reference. Uh, then, um, uh, yes, uh, I can re repeat and confirm uh, that uh, the Russian side is negotiating with Japan a peace treaty issue uh, and uh, in accordance uh, with, uh, with the uh, joint declaration of the Soviet Union and uh, Japan uh, signed in 1956. Uh, all other issues uh, should be uh, dealt with after the peace treaty uh, is uh, signed, after the peace treaty has been signed. Uh, and. Here is a very important point, uh, uh, which is often forgotten uh, when uh, one talks about uh, this joint declaration. Uh, well, everybody in Japan, or not everybody, many, 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 uh, many people in Japan are focusing only on the uh, uh, ninth article of the declaration, uh, which is referring uh, to certain islands. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we uh, are confident that uh, we should not forget uh, about the Article 1st, Article 1, one of uh, this joint declaration, uh, which stipulates that there will be friendly and good, neighbor, good neighborly relations uh, between Russia and Japan. Uh, uh, and uh, here in this area, I mean, building up uh, uh, truly uh, friendly and uh, good neighbor rela relations. Uh, we have many things to do together from now on uh, with regard to uh, the uh, development without any artificial restrictions. Uh, our uh, cooperation, our coordination, our, our exchange in such areas as political, di political dialogue, trade, economic, and investment cooperation, science and technology cooperation, building up uh, confidence-building measures uh, in the area of security, uh, also coordination in international affairs, far more uh, than, uh, than, uh, and deeper than it is being done nowadays. Uh, cultural, educational, inter-regional, inter and other exchange. So in the, in the course of this kind of development of uh, Russian-Japanese relations, we are ready to uh, continue peace treaty dialogue, of course. Peace treaty, as, uh, we, uh, which we see, which we consider as a broad and comprehensive uh, document. 
Uh, well, uh, you asked about the further plans uh, of uh, Russian-Japanese dialogue. Well, first of all, I frankly, Pierre, uh, I'm sorry, maybe I, 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 uh, I, I'm not fully informed, but uh, in my view, the COVID situation is not improving. Uh, it is unfortunately well, wor worsening. Well, we all wish uh, it, 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 it to improve, of course. Uh, and it, it hinders greatly uh, exchanges in many parts of, in, in many areas of our, uh, let's say, normal activity. Uh, so we hope that uh, as soon as these uh, COVID factors influence, uh, 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 will be reduced. Uh, of course, we uh, would like to start, uh, restart our dialogue with Japan, uh, including uh, uh, convening uh, sessions, session of uh, the Intergovernmental Commission on uh, Trade and Economic Issues, including Mr. Minister Lavrov's visit uh, to uh, Japan. Uh, as my minister said, well, maybe in two or three months uh, we will make uh, decisions. Uh, we will find a mutually acceptable period or mutually uh, mutual acceptable period of time, mutually acceptable date. And then we will see together with our Japanese uh, partners and colleagues what can be done further. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and since we m mentioned uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, Sarah, so he made many historical visits at that time also to China in 1989. So now President Putin is uh, going to China. So there are uh, questions from our online participants about uh, relationships between Russia and China. For example, um, Andy Sharp, Nikkei Asia. Uh, here's the question. In November last year, two Russian and two Chinese bombers conducted a group flight exercise from Russia's Far East down to the Sea of Japan. This followed joint exercises in 2019 and 2020 through the Sea of Japan and on the uh, East China Sea and the Pacific last October. Uh, the country's uh, navies deployed 10 ships through the Tsugaru Strait mm -hmm. uh, and down through the East China Sea. What is the intention of these joint exercises with China? Uh, they clearly show stronger military ties in the region, but uh, are you now in a de facto military alliance with China? It was a question from Andy Sharp, Nick Kay. Are you in, in, in a de facto military de facto alliance? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, similar mm -hmm. question from Isabel Reynolds, Bl mm, Bloomberg, uh, Japan's defense mm -hmm. ministry in November expressed concern about joint military exercises between Russia and China. What is your response to such concerns and why is the Russian military working more closely with um, the Chinese army? Uh, and, um, well, Generally speaking, uh, how uh, can you characterize Russia's developing, developing relationship with China and what Russia is seeking through the uh, expanded ties with Beijing? This was the question from our mm -hmm. Chinese colleague, South China Morning Post, Peter Langan. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is the different, what's the difference from the Gorbachev visit, uh, well, as he uh, put it, what, what's the, I, I'm probably he means what's the difference between uh, the character of relationship between Russia and uh, China at that time and now? Mm -hmm. So first mm -hmm. about the concerns of Russia uh, of uh, Japanese side about military joint military exercises. Are we de facto in military alliance with China, mm -hmm. and what is the intention mm -hmm. to expand mm -hmm. ties with China? Well, first of all, I. Uh, I take note that our, we are going further and further from Europe, which is <laughs> the main topic of our meeting today, but okay. Uh, we will return, actually, okay. after, uh, after uh, we I, finish. I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, may I ask this well, the complex of questions uh, from Nikkei Asia, from Bloomberg, and other colleagues? Well, first of all, uh, Nikkei Asia counted very attentively uh, the uh, number and, uh, and the, the 
content of uh, Russian-Chinese uh, joint military exercises. Uh, recent, uh, which have uh, been conducted uh, recently. Uh, I think it took about several seconds for you, Sergey, to, to pronounce it. If I uh, now try to, uh, to, to, to mention all the military exercises conducted by Japan, uh, self-defense forces, and uh, the U.S. forces uh, with uh, the f uh, forces of uh, NATO countries, Australia, uh, Quad countries, and others, uh, I think uh, FCCG uh, will have to summon another news conference for me just to present uh, the titles of this or that uh, military exercise. Uh, saying that, uh, I uh, try to uh, describe uh, the security si situation in the Far East. We in Russia and our strategic partners in China are facing now, or have to face uh, now. Uh, that is why my response to these questions will be quite clear. Uh, the, uh, Russia, uh, the Russian and uh, the Chinese uh, military forces, uh, taking into account that Russia and China are strategic partners, uh, they are just doing their job. And their job is uh, to protect national interests of uh, Russia and China, respectively, uh, in uh, the area of uh, security. Uh, to uh, defend our borders uh, and uh, to uh, elevate the uh, level of uh, cooperation with regard to uh, protecting our joint interests in the area of security uh, in the Asia uh, Pacific. I think it's only natural uh, for uh, two neighboring countries which, uh, again, I repeat, are in relations of strategic partnership uh, to, uh, evel to el elevate the level of uh, their security cooperation, including military aspect, along with uh, the very dynamic, uh, very mm, uh, a positive and a very active uh, development of relations in other areas of our strategic partnership, uh, such as uh, economic cooperation, such as uh, uh, cooperation in uh, a solution of topical international issues, such as uh, exchange in uh, the areas of science, technology, uh, education, uh, cultural and sport. Uh, by the way, uh, as you know, President Putin is going to attend the opening ceremony of uh, the Beijing Winter Olympics, which is uh, another manifestation of, uh, uh, of a very close nature of our strategic partnership and uh, our cooperation, our close cooperation in the area of uh, sports. Uh, so. Uh, uh, that is how I, I would like to uh, uh, answer this part of the question. Uh, are we in a, a de facto military uh, alliance with the United, uh, sorry, with, uh, with China? Uh, I, I, uh, uh, I would like to repeat that uh, we are in uh, our relations uh, with China, our relations of strategic partnership, which is very, very broad. Uh, broad uh, notion, and uh, uh, with regard to the uh, question uh, about the concerns of the Japanese uh, Defense Ministry about uh, Russian-Chinese uh, military exercises in the Asia-Pacific Asia -Pacific region, I think in the, uh, in the very beginning, uh, of uh, my uh, answer to the question of Nikkei Asia, I mentioned uh, that 
uh, maybe it is for us to express uh, concern every time um, on growing uh, military activity headed by the United States and uh, in the Asia Pacific region, uh, including such unprecedented actions uh, like uh, appearance, uh, the appearance in the Asia Pacific area of what the NATO itself, of what the countries concerned themselves uh, called as a striking naval group uh, headed by the air carrier of the British fleet, uh, Queen Elizabeth. So uh, in, these in, such a, in such circumstances, we have to take care of our security interests we have to take care about training our military to protect our security interests in the area. Thank you. So, next question, please. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you for coming to FCCJ. Uh, I'm also a uh, Co chair of this committee that uh, organizes this uh, event with the PO. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Teddy Jimbo. Um, uh, I uh, run an internet uh, media, uh, videonews.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so back to our uh, European situation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's a widely shared view among the experts that the uh, both sides, the US and Russia, not, neither have a serious intention to engage in the military, uh, actual mi military. Uh, uh, action, at least not uh, in a full-scale one. Uh, but at the same time, both, has, both sides seem to have uh, enough uh, reasons to uh, draw domestic attention to uh, foreign uh, issues. Uh, they have enough issue problems domestically, not to mention um, elections are coming up, especially in the U.S., but also uh, in Russia as well. So, uh, and when there's a military buildup uh, in, near the front line, no one knows what's going to happen. Uh, so some say uh, maybe they're pl uh, playing fire with fire. Maybe it's too dangerous play that they're engaged in. Uh, what's the uh, Russia's view uh, on that? Uh, that's number one. And also, if the current uh, situation where there's simply military kind of buildup uh, near the front line and so, so, sort of a rhetoric uh, exchange just continues without actual military action, uh, in your view, who is gaining what, uh, uh, given that, uh, provided that uh, if there's actually a military uh, confrontation or the uh, uh, engagement, no one, no one gains nothing. So uh, who is gaining from the existing situation? And if I may, uh, just one, one, one question about the Northern Territories, uh, if, if I may. Um, there is a, also another widely shared view uh, in Japan that any agreement uh, on the Northern Territories with Russia, uh, either uh, two plus two or two, two islands or whatever, mm -hmm. it's bad for Japan because the you, you, United States is not happy. Uh, there's such a view in Japan. Uh, do you, uh, is there any such notion on the Russian side that Japan, the mainstream Japan or LDP, would not back any agreement because uh, once Japan and Russia settles this issue, then uh, U.S. Uh, Japan and the U, uh, Russia will become too close, so that U.S. and uh, uh, Japan U.S. security uh, mm -hmm. will be undermined, or whatever the reason is. But there's a widely notion uh, in Japan, and that's I think that's the truth. Mm -hmm. So uh, I like to uh, hear your view on that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Terry. Uh, first of all, about uh, the European situation. Uh, well, uh, I would like to, frankly, uh, to oppose your view uh, that uh, Russia is uh, trying to uh, distract uh, our public opinion's attention from our domestic, uh, domestic agenda. It's not true. Uh, we have a responsible president, we have responsible government, and uh, which is which, and they are on everyday basis uh, dealing with the domestic problems of Russia, uh, without any uh, attempt to connect somehow 
uh, this our domestic uh, agenda to uh, what is now happening uh, uh, in the area of European security and what is now uh, happening within the domestic civil conflict in Ukraine. Uh, I think uh, the contrary, uh, <laughs> contrary uh, opinion uh, might be true. Uh, one of the goals of the one of the strategic goals of the Russian foreign policy is to uh, create favorable condition for our domestic development, and from that point of view, we of course want to see stable and predictable uh, situation uh, uh, in the immediate vicinity uh, of our borders. Uh, as far as the United States are concerned, is concerned, yes, uh, we always uh, hear uh, from the U.S. side that they uh, uh, would have these or that elections, and these or that elections might influence these or that uh, foreign policy activity uh, of the U.S. It's very regretful. Uh, because uh, if uh, <laughs> the foreign policy is influenced uh, by the uh, narrowed uh, interests of uh, this or that American politician in this or that American uh, state, uh, it, it's, not, uh, <laughs> it's, not, it's not good. And uh, I think it's not, uh, it's not even uh, it's not even permissible for a country uh, that uh, claims to be a world leader, uh, that claims to be uh, absolutely baselessly claims to be a, wor a world leader. So uh, uh, that is uh, this is why um, I, I uh, strongly deny any connection between. Russian domestic agenda and uh, uh, our initiative uh, 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 with regard to European security in, in the context, in the sense you mentioned about it. Uh, I, I uh, explained to you a true interconnection between foreign policy and domestic policy uh, of uh, Russia. That's the first point. About military build-up, as you said, around the front line. Uh, well, uh, if there is any front line, it is in the eastern part of Ukraine, uh, between the uh, uh, between the uh, troops of Kiev regime and nationalist battalions, uh, which are out of control of Kiev regime, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, proclaimed republics. Uh, uh, that is the area where there is a front line. There is no front line between Russia and Ukraine. Maybe there is front line in the minds of Ukrainian politicians, uh, but not, <laughs> not, it, it's not about Russia. Uh, again, uh, I would like to uh, say that uh, the relocation of the Russian troops in, uh, the, within the Russian national territory, it's a purely domestic affair of Russia. Uh, we have the right to relocate our troops uh, within our national territory without asking any permission uh, from uh, anybody. Uh, but uh, as you uh, took up this issue, uh, I would like to explain uh, what, frankly, uh, we have explained uh, recently uh, on other international venues. Uh, that uh, it is not true to say, uh, it is not correct to say that uh, Russia is uh, trying to uh, concentrate, concentrate its troops near its border with Ukraine. Uh, all our troops uh, are uh, within their garrisons, not uh, out of uh, the garrisons. So. Uh, the the uh, demands to uh, move them back to the barracks are uh, groundless uh, in, in themselves. Uh, then uh, we wonder uh, where uh, did the Western media and Western officials uh, 
find uh, the, 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 the number of uh, 100 Russian troops near the Ukrainian border. Uh, 100,000, sorry, Russian troops near the Ukrainian border. Uh, we have never announced the number of these troops. Uh, we have never confirmed uh, this figure. And uh, 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 this highly likely style of uh, our Western counterparts is uh, clear again. And I would like to remind uh, you, dear friends, that no Russian politician, uh, no Russian official in no way uh, had has threatened uh, an incursion uh, to Ukraine. Uh, the uh, rumors about the so alleged incursion to Ukraine were born on the Western side, were all born on the Western side. And Western side was so active in uh, promoting and whipping up these rumors that the Ukrainian government itself was greatly frightened and the Ukrainian top-level officials started saying, oh, please, wait a minute, uh, no panic, uh, nothing, nothing, uh, uh, nothing bad is uh, going to happen. Uh, so uh, uh, I would like to emphasize again and again that, that uh, if it depends on Russia, there will be no war. And uh, we expect uh, responsible, uh, responsible uh, behavior from the uh, US side and from the NATO side and from the Ukrainian side. Now, or, but what we see now, now the US and uh, NATO uh, uh, are pumping Ukraine, uh, are pumping Kyiv regime with weapons. Uh, and, uh, but we all know that the Kyiv regime uh, uses uh, these weapons against uh, its uh, own citizens in the eastern part of Ukraine, including air force, including artillery, including, including um, uh, mines, uh, etc. Uh, so it is a very dangerous policy to pump uh, with uh, weapons such an irresponsible uh, regime uh, that can easily provoke Mm, um, uh, the, the military confrontation in the area of its conflict with uh, their its own citizens in the eastern part of in the eastern part of Ukraine, and we also expect uh, that Kyiv regime uh, will be uh, responsible enough not to uh, whip up tensions in uh, international dimension. Now we know uh, that uh, Kyiv is planning on the 25th and 26th of February uh, what it calls first Black Sea Security Conference, uh, which uh, it considers as a continuation of, of uh, another provocative uh, idea, so-called Crimea platform. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, we are strongly against uh, these uh, groundless allegations uh, about uh, alleged Russian aggressive intentions towards Ukraine, uh, which, as we uh, anticipate, will be the main topic uh, during the so-called uh, Black Sea Security Conference. And I would like to use uh, this floor to, uh, made it, to make it clear that uh, the participation of any country in this uh, provocative idea of Kyiv regime uh, would have consequences for these countries uh, with regard to their bilateral relations with my country, with Russia. Uh, then uh, about uh, the so-called territorial issue you uh, mentioned, uh, Terry. Uh, well, uh, uh, Terry, uh, you are a seasoned and experienced journalist, and probably you uh, know very well that Russia does not, uh, does not uh, make friendship with one country against another country. So we are, uh, we, may, we can be friends, good friends, uh, with any country on the basis of mutual respect 
uh, non-interference and uh, uh, equal dialogue and cooperation. Uh, and our friendship with any country, with China uh, and other countries, is not uh, directed against any other, uh, against any third uh, country. Uh, that is why uh, I told you, Sergey, that we diplomats uh, dislike answering what if questions, but in this very case, I have to, <laughs> I have to answer. Uh, no way. Uh, if uh, we conclude a peace treaty with Japan, and if uh, we uh, uh, solve all the issues uh, that uh, may be discussed after conclusion uh, of the peace treaty, uh, it uh, will be in no way directed uh, against any other state. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the concerns in the United States, which, you, which as you said, exist or may exist, uh, I don't know, but you said so, uh, are baseless. Uh, we, uh, you see, uh, it is not by accident uh, that we so strongly emphasize the principle of indivisibility of security in Europe. Uh, in fact, uh, we uh, uh, are of uh, an opinion we are of the opinion that this principle uh, can be applied uh, to security arrangements in any other area of the world, uh, including Asia-Pacific uh, region. So uh, we adhere to the principle uh, that no country uh, should uh, solve its security, should build up its security uh, at the expense of uh, security interests of any other state. And uh, we follow this principle both in Europe and in Asia, and in Africa, and in the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. So it is, uh, we, we consider this principle as a universally recognized one. Uh, uh, and we can refer again to the Istanbul, Har Istanbul Charter, Istanbul Charter, sorry, uh, which proclaims this principle. Uh, and uh, all the leaders, presidents and prime ministers of uh, OEC member states, including NATO member states, signed, uh, put their signs in the doc uh, uh, the document, proclaims this principle. So we expect uh, the other countries, that other countries also will follow these principles as we follow it. Thank you. Now, well, speaking of Istanbul, Mr. Ambassador, we have a question from Iglis Yorosmas, uh, BBC World. BBC yes. World. Uh -huh. Yes, Mr. Ambassador, what are the advantages and disadvantages of Turkey's mediation between your country and Ukraine on this conflict? Also, Turkey is Russia's largest gas um, export market after mm -hmm. e EU, depending on the outcome of the conflict. What is uh, likely to happen to Turk Stream? Natural gas pipeline, pipeline project, uh, are you worried that the country will find other sources to import gas? This was... Mm -hmm. that's Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much. Well, first of all, I would like to emphasize it again. Maybe I was not uh, clear enough uh, in my previous presentation. But I would like to emphasize that Russia is not a party of uh, Donbas settlement. It, uh, Russia is not a party of uh, the domestic civil conflict uh, in Ukraine. And Russia. Uh, as well as France, Germany, and OECE, is uh, one of the guarantors of uh, the implementation of Minsk agreements, which, again, uh, is uh, the only uh, legal basis uh, for the settlement of domestic civil conflict in Ukraine, uh, the basis which was approved as it is, as such, uh, by the UN Security Council, so uh, these Minsk agreements, by the resolution 2202, and uh, thus Minsk agreements are uh, a part of international law. They are codified within the international law. Uh, that is why to talk about mediation of any country uh, with regard to Russia, uh, with regard to uh, conflict in Ukraine, 
is not fully correct, frankly. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, if uh, our Turkish friends uh, can use their influence uh, to make Kiev regime to carry out, to fulfill its obligations in accordance with the Minsk agreements, uh, we, will, uh, we will warmly welcome, we will appreciate such uh, development. Uh, as far as our cooperation uh, with uh, Turkey in other areas is concerned, uh, I, as far as I know, uh, uh, we have very close mutually beneficial cooperation in many areas. Uh, we have a trust-based uh, top-level dialogue uh, between President Putin and President Erdogan. Uh, we have uh, very, uh, very developed, uh, very broad uh, system of uh, consultations uh, through various channels between our government on the topical issues of our economical, political, uh, scientific, cultural, uh, and other cooperation. And uh, I do not. Uh, I think that there is. Uh, 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 understanding between Russia and Turkey, as well as between Russia and many other uh, counter our international counterparts, uh, that uh, political affairs, that political problems, uh, should not uh, should not uh, negatively influence uh, our cooperation, mutually beneficial, pragmatic cooperation uh, in other areas. Uh, that is actually what we uh, say about our relations with Japan. Uh, we uh, are not supporters uh, of, uh, we are not, we do not support uh, any hint that uh, any political differences uh, or any differences on our political agenda uh, should uh, be a pretext, pretext for hindering development of our mutually beneficial uh, cooperation in other areas. Uh, 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 that also goes to our relations to Turkey, I'm sure. Uh, thank you. So we are way out of time. Can, can we ask you for a... I, I'm, for, I'm at your disposal, okay, uh, dear friends. So, please, Pia, next question. Well, if you say you are at our disposal, I guess we will release you only tonight. <laughs> <clears throat> With pleasure. I, 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 frankly, in my uh, agenda for today, in my schedule for today, there is no other event, only this. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so, guys, be ready to stay on. <clears throat> Mr. Ambassador, let's uh, go back to Europe, as you suggested. <clears throat> Uh, President Putin has uh, uh, made in the last week, and I think a few days of Friday, a very interesting initiative, inviting uh, Italian businessmen mm. to a Zoom uh, uh, meeting, mm. bypassing uh, by practically the government. Mm -hmm. The Italian government was not so happy about that, but it was very successful among the Italian companies. Mm -hmm. And I believe there is a plan to do that with the French too. Do you think it could be a good idea for doing this toward the Japanese companies? I mean, a meeting between the Mitsubishi, Tachi, mm -hmm. Toyota, mm -hmm. with Putin directly, because sometimes government are in the way of trade deals and negotiation mm -hmm. and stuff like that. This is the first one. The second is uh, talking about the gas to Europe. When do you think that uh, uh, Putin and the Germans will agree on opening up uh, the Stream 2, which will probably be very helpful for Europe getting uh, gas? And the last one is uh, I understand that Sputnik vaccine mm -hmm. is now available in Japan. Mm -hmm. Has it been officially recognized? Because mm -hmm. that would be the first uh, so-called Western country mm -hmm. in Europe, uh, I understand, is not yet um, approved. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, as back chair, co-chair with Jimbo, the last is an invita a pre-invitation. Mm -hmm. We are planning to have uh, again you, ambassador of Russia, and the Chinese ambassador together. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a preemptive? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pio. Uh, well, uh, uh, first of all, yes, I uh, read and read with great pleasure uh, our official reports about uh, President Putin's meeting with uh, the Italian business community representatives the other day uh, or in uh, the format of online discussion. Uh, I, I, frankly, uh, Pio, uh, being here in Tokyo and uh, uh, being not in charge of uh, dealing with uh, Russian-Italian relations, which if we talk about bilateral, uh, bilateral uh, agenda are, in my view, uh, in a very positive, uh, in an excellent shape. Uh, I would like just to, to, to uh, express my personal view uh, that, uh, that uh, we uh, maintain uh, relations, exchange, uh, with the business communities of foreign countries uh, in a way that is comfortable for our counterparts. In this case, the Italian business community. If the Italian business community agreed to have an online conference, conference with my president, uh, in a way it was conducted, in, uh, it was really conducted, that means that, uh, that it was comfortable for the Italian business and it was acceptable uh, for our side. So uh, if the Italian government has anything to, to, to say about this, uh, I think uh, it can find, uh, it can find, uh, it, it can find a way uh, to communicate with the Italian business. It's, I, I don't know what is going on uh, on the uh, side of communication between Italian government and Italian business. Uh, and, of course, uh, we are uh, very much in favor of uh, the broadest possible economic cooperation with Japan, including communication with the Japanese business community, actually. Uh, uh, that is what I'm trying to do on an everyday basis, uh, being ambassador here in Tokyo. And I also recollect that they were uh, very uh, very friendly, very positive meetings between President Putin and Japanese business community uh, in Moscow. And uh, President Putin attaches great importance to the, the, the uh, uh, constructive dialogue, constructive dialogue based on mutual respect uh, with the Japanese business community. I recollect uh, when uh, quite recently, uh, during uh, Eastern Economic Forum uh, and during St. Petersburg International Economic Forum back in May uh, 2018, uh, President Putin attended uh, for a long time, one or two hours, I attended these meetings, I, 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 I remember. Uh, attended a very long and profound discussions with the Japanese business community. I mean, there were uh, participants from Japanese business community, from the Russian business community, from the Russian government, from the Japanese government, and of course, President Putin and Prime Minister Abe uh, were there. So we are not against, uh, we are in favor of uh, closest possible uh, communication with the Japanese business community, provided that it is organized in a way which is comfortable for our Japanese counterparts. I mean, uh, we, uh, we, we, we do not want to bother anybody, and uh, we uh, want uh, that both sides feel comfortable to uh, in, in, within the discussion of, uh, on the prospects of mutually beneficial uh, cooperation. Uh, when the North, 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 North Stream 2 uh, will be launched finally, well, uh, as far as I understand, uh, the, 
uh, I, uh, it, it's not um, uh, part of my portfolio. Uh, please, uh, I, I would like to be understood correctly. Uh, but as far as I understand, uh, the, the pipeline, uh, the pipeline uh, construction uh, has completed uh, recently. And uh, uh, well, now it's the, there is a procedure of certification going on on the German side, as I understand. If I if 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 I if I cite so correct, it seems that the U.S. are mm -hmm. asking the Germans to delay. Oh well, uh, no surprise uh, that uh, the U.S. is asking uh, Germans uh, to delay. If if it if 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 uh, uh, I don't know whether it's true or not, uh, but it seems to me something says to me uh, that it is true, and uh, there is no surprise for me uh, because uh, if it is about Russia. Uh, the United States stance is always quite negative. I think I clearly informed you about our view on the reasons of this uh, behavior of the United States in the very beginning of my uh, presentation today. Uh, so, uh, as, as far as Sputnik is concerned, uh, yes, uh, the, the, in the very end of, uh, uh, of uh, January, uh, we convened a news conference uh, at our embassy in Minatoku uh, to present uh, the project between uh, project uh, of uh, starting what we call preclinic uh, preclinic tests uh, of Sputnik V and Sputnik light vaccines in Hibia Koksai clinic here in Tokyo uh, uh, the the uh, representatives of uh, the clinic uh, explained in detail how it can be done, uh, how these uh, jabs can be uh, can be uh, can, can be got. Uh, if you wish, if you have an interest, you can uh, see the details on the web resources of uh, Hebrew International Clinic. But uh, shortly speaking. Uh, the vaccines uh, will be used uh, for the patients who would wish uh, to have these uh, injections. Uh, and uh, uh, seeing the results of uh, the uh, uh, tests, uh, the clinic will make, as I understand, further decisions on how to deal with uh, this vaccine. I mean, uh, maybe to uh, seek for certification in Japan, etc., for maybe broader use uh, of uh, this vaccine. Uh, and in this context, I would like to uh, emphasize that uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, use of this vaccine in Russia is quite successful. Uh, but speaking about uh, Japan, about Tokyo, I would like to say that here is Mikhail Galuzin, a Russian citizen, uh, who got three jabs of Sputnik and uh, still, uh, still in a very healthy condition. And uh, it is, uh, it, it's, it's, it's uh, one more additional manifestation that uh, Sputnik vaccine is very much effective, uh, safe, uh, and has good uh, prospects. Thank you. Yeah, one, one more okay, manifestation actually huh? sitting next okay. behind, next to you. Oh, so. uh, sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, uh, let's uh, discuss it between uh, <laughs> during th three party talks. Uh, you, myself, and uh, our distinguished Chinese uh, colleague. I, I, I uh, think it's a good idea, but let's discuss how, 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 how it can be done. Let's ask, of course, our Chinese colleague uh, about this. Well, personally, uh, myself um, is, is very much in favor of, uh, the bro in principle, uh, uh, in favor of the broadest possible communication with the Japanese media community with the Japanese public opinion. 
Thank you. So I think, well, time is, yes. Before we uh, finish, we would like to in introduce, to present you uh, our honorary uh, annual membership of oh. the club. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So. Yes. Thank you so much. It's a great honor for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, it was very interesting.